You've seen him take on the hottest pepper in the world, or at least the hottest we could conveniently get shipped in the mail. You've seen him survive three days homeless on the streets of Los Angeles. You've seen him live for 24 hours trapped in a bathtub and give a poor delivery driver trust issues. Now we're turning over our fourth from the bottom most important writer to you, the fans, and leaving him to your mercies. Today, we're putting him in a survival challenge situation that comes straight from the viewers, 72 hours alone in the forest. Ok, so before I get into my experiences with this challenge, I just want to be upfront and state that this might be my last challenge episode. The infographic show pays me well for the sometimes dangerous situations I get myself into, but after this challenge I had to step back and really think about if I want to continue with these challenges. As you'll find out, I ran into some serious trouble out there, and things could have gone bad multiple times, and I think I just need to reevaluate things going forward. Unfortunately, I lost my journal during one of these incidents, so I'll have to work from memory on retelling my wilderness survival experience. When I first got the challenge, I was kind of excited. Truth be told, one of the reasons I do these challenges is because I like pushing my limits. I hate sitting at home being comfortable all the time, which might sound weird, but I guess I've accepted that it's just who I am. It definitely drives the girlfriend crazy who would prefer I live a perfectly safe, normal life. Three days and nights alone in the forest and not just the backyard woods, we're talking real forest. For this challenge I actually went up to NorCal because SoCal isn't so well known for forests. Plus, we're entering fall which means that the few mountain forests that are here are going to get very, very cold and possibly even snowed on, which would very quickly make this challenge extremely dangerous. For a solo challenge with no support, I'm not willing to risk it. I went up north enough to hit the rainforests of the Pacific Northwest. The show's lawyers have warned that we shouldn't give out any specific locations so that nobody's crazy enough to try to go up there and repeat our experiment. This is also a perfect opportunity to state the obvious. Don't do this. Seriously, don't. I know it sounds easy to do some silly challenge, but the fact is that wilderness survival is pretty serious business. I have training courtesy of the US military on how to survive in various wilderness environments, and years of experience putting that knowledge to the real world test in very stressful situations. You may think you're ready from watching a bunch of YouTube prepper videos, but believe me, you're not. This isn't some weird flex. It would honestly devastate me to find out a fan decided to go out there and try this for real and got themselves hurt or worse. If you're interested in survival, take some local classes or join the Boy Scouts. Get out there into the woods in a supervised environment and build the fundamentals. Matter of fact, I recommend it to everyone. You never know when some basic survival skills will come in handy. Now back to the challenge. For this challenge, I'll have only a survival knife, which, by the way, is not a fancy Leatherman or anything like that. It's literally a folding knife, and that's about it, though it's pretty wicked sharp. It has a reinforced grip and the bottom of the grip is blunted so that you can use it to smash things, but that's about all the utility you're getting out of it. I'll also have the clothes I wear, which will be underwear, thermal underwear, hiking pants, t-shirt, sweatshirt, and poncho. Sadly, I can only take the socks I get to wear, which do not estimate the necessity of fresh socks in this survival situation. The moment your feet go bad, your odds of survival plummet dramatically. That's about it, except for four packets of energy gel, a map of the local area, and a compass. The energy gel is for emergencies only, and the map and compass so that I can navigate my way back to my pickup at the end of three days. I'm going to only briefly peruse the map so I'm oriented before heading in, but I will be scouting out the wilderness myself to find sources of water and food. No cheating by pinpointing the locations of lakes, rivers, or anything like that beforehand. I originally wanted to take a crew member with me to document things as I thought it might be fun for you guys to see them more than just animation, but sadly hiring out professional crew is pretty expensive. And then there's union concerns over the nature of this challenge, as well as insurance which adds up to a pretty <laughs> whopping figure. Basically, until the infographics is a TV show, I would count this possibility out. You know what to do fans, start writing to the big TV studios. I got dropped off at 5 in the morning on my first day by friends I have from my time in the military who live in the local area. We mapped out a general area which I would try to stay inside by using some easily identifiable boundaries, such as a set of cliffs and a river. And then we picked three different rendezvous locations for pickup. This way if I got injured there would always be a pickup location nearby that I could get to no matter where within the area I wandered. Also, it would give any search and rescue parties places to start their efforts at. 
Planning is extremely important for wilderness survival. When you're in a survival situation, you have to immediately prioritize and then work on your needs in order of priority. My first need was to find water, as I could easily survive the three days with no food, but would get into trouble really fast if I couldn't find drinkable water. I'm near the coast, but hopefully everyone watching knows that drinking seawater is an absolute no-go. One big benefit though is that early in the morning mist blows off the sea and saturates trees and bushes with water droplets. My problem was that I had no container to store water in, so I decided to take a risk and take off my poncho to turn that into a makeshift water bag. When you're in the wilderness, staying dry is very important because being wet can very quickly lead to hypothermia, even if the outside temperature is not that cold. Water is really good at leaching heat from your body into the environment, so it's important to stay dry as much as you can. However, being wet is also a really good way for bacterial and fungal infections to take hold and can absolutely devastate your feet. Once more, if your feet go bad, your odds of survival fall dramatically. Go image search trench foot and see why it's important to stay dry. Just make sure you do it on an empty stomach. I gathered the corners of my poncho to turn it into a makeshift bag, and then I took my shirt off while putting back on my sweatshirt, and I used the t-shirt to wick up moisture off tall grasses and tree leaves. Then it was as simple as wringing out the water into my poncho bag, and pretty soon I had a decent amount of water stored up, enough that I felt safe looking for a more permanent solution. With water temporarily taken care of, I started looking for a place I could set up long term. If you can find a cave, that's the most ideal place to take shelter, though you have to worry about animals who are thinking the same thing, and this typically means mountain lions and bears here in the US. I was too far from the mountains in the distance to risk trying to find a cave, so I decided I could pretty easily build a lean-to shelter from all the fallen tree branches and dead leaves. Location though is important so I surveyed my environment to figure out where to build my shelter. I was very near the coast, probably only two or three miles from the beach, and the terrain sloped slowly upward to the distant mountains to my east. There was another stretch of mountains north of me which told me that I was in a very broad valley, and that's very good news, because if I followed parallel to the coastline, the odds of finding a small stream or full-blown river were really good. All that mountain snow has to run off somewhere, and it would either pool into lakes between the sea and the mountain cul-de-sac I was in, or it would run as streams. I hiked for a few hours as the sun started to rise and evaporate all of the mist. If you're relying on condensation from mist for water, you want to collect it very early in the morning because as soon as the sun rises it's going to start evaporating. Shortly before noon I hit a small creek winding its way through the middle of the woods, exactly as I predicted so I decided to set up shop near it. You might be tempted to build your shelter right there next to the water, but that can be a bad idea for several reasons. First of all, heavy rain or other events further upstream could cause the water level to suddenly rise, which could wash away your shelter. Second, animals like water too, including predators. It's important to note though that even herbivores can be very dangerous, and yes, deer can and have killed people before. I decided I'd build my lean-to about 20 minutes from the water and got ridiculously lucky when I found a large overturned tree that had collapsed onto another tree. With the two trees acting as a wall and a roof, I simply got to work sawing off large branches and laying them down over both trees. Then I covered the leafy branches with dead leaves and a bunch of grass, covered that in turn with a layer of dirt and once more another layer of leafy branches and grass. Thankfully, there were plenty of bushes around and by the end of it, I had a pretty decent little lean-to build. Even better, I found a bunch of grubs in the dead wood, and as long as you avoid the little nasty pinchers mm. some of them have, they make for a great snack. Grubs may be gross, but they're jam-packed with protein and fat. Generally, the grosser an insect looks to you, the better it is to eat. The only bugs you should avoid are any with a hard shell such as roaches or grasshoppers. You should eat those only if you've roasted them in a fire because of parasites. You can still get parasites from plenty of other things, but you always want to mitigate your odds of danger as much as possible. Survival is risky business, plain and simple. I decided the next thing I needed was tools and the very first thing I needed was something for self-defense. This being fall, the odds of running into a bear were lower than normal, but because most bears would be looking for a place to hibernate by now, this leaves only the bears who didn't pack on as many pounds and were desperately trying to add weight. These bears are far more dangerous than they normally would be and this fact would come into play very soon. I decided I'd use the knife to make a spear and hunt it around for a long, decently thick branch I could use. It took a bit more time but I managed to find a nice hardwood branch with good length on it. 
but instead of sharpening the tip to a point, I decided that the branch was stiff enough to simply splint the top of it into a cross shape. In an emergency, I could jam the open knife into the tip deep enough to stay firmly secure, and I'd have myself a pretty efficient and deadly spear, far deadlier than a sharpened stick. It would probably only last a few jabs into a big animal, but that should be enough to drive it back. Next, I set about working on a way to contain and transport water. Notice again that I'm more worried about water than food. I really can't stress enough how important water is. This being a Pacific Northwest rainforest, I knew I couldn't rely on the poncho forever, as I'd eventually need to stay dry myself. I tried finding discarded tree bark, hoping I could fashion a few pieces of bark into a rough bowl shape. But I actually got even luckier than that, I found a white plastic bag. Normally I hate people who litter, but in this case it ended up being exactly what I needed, though you still shouldn't litter. Water is good, but water safety is also very important. So next I worked on a way to help make the water from the creek safe to drink. I found tree bark which I could rip off, and I managed to get a large curved piece which I could bend just slightly into a very shallow bowl shape. It wouldn't hold much water and I'd be reduced to basically taking sips at a time, but it was the best I could do. I need a fire to make the water safe though, and this proved far more difficult than anything before. It actually took me until just a few hours before nightfall to get a fire going. Starting a fire with no tools has always been one of my weak areas, and it didn't help that most of the wood I could find was pretty humid thanks to how wet the Pacific Northwest tends to be. Without tools, the best way to start a fire is to gather some kindling, dry pine needles work like a charm, and a piece of large soft wood. You can typically find soft wood in the large branches of living trees, or just split a very young tree in half. The wood from dead trees is hard and no good for this. But it is good for the second thing you need, a stick of very hard wood. Basically you create a channel down the middle of the soft wood and you put your kindling at the bottom of it. Then with your hard wood stick you rub it up and down the channel over and over again repeatedly for hours until you finally cause enough friction to actually light the kindling. Now I've seen people do this in just 15 minutes, but it took me hours to get going. Like I said, not my strong suit in the survival game. Eventually though I had a small fire just outside my lean-to, and I gathered up some large flat rocks so that I could eventually cook on them. For now though I had spent my entire day setting up shelter, building tools, and finding water, so there wouldn't be much food to eat. Instead, I heated up one of the large flat rocks in the middle of the fire, and then pulled it out with sticks. I immediately placed my makeshift bowl on the hot rock, and filled it with as much water as I could manage, which wasn't very much. Tree bark makes for terrible bowls. Boiling water was going to be out of the question without metal tools, but if you can heat water up enough, it can destroy harmful bacteria. It's an imperfect solution, but like I said before, survival comes with risks, and your job is to simply mitigate, not negate those risks. With a decent little camp set up, I returned to the creek as the sun started to set, hoping I could score some water critters for dinner. I didn't want to be away from camp when night fell, so I wouldn't accidentally get lost, so I didn't spend much time looking. Sadly, the only thing I managed to score was some edible lichens, which wouldn't do much to curb my hunger after not eating all day. That's alright though, because I had water to drink and that was far more important. Dealing with hunger is easy as long as you're hydrated. That night I planned out my strategy for day two. I had dried my clothing over the fire and dried my feet off by holding them close to the fire. Water was nearby and plentiful, and I figured with only three days out here I could risk getting sick by drinking without treating the water, because trying to sterilize sips of water at a time just wasn't going to work out long term. I knew I was only a few miles from the coast, so I planned on following the creek to the beach to find mussels and other edibles. The coast can be a bonanza of stuff to eat if you don't mind the gross taste. All in all, my situation was looking pretty good. I even managed to keep embers going in a small pit inside my lean-to when it started to rain outside. Then things took a turn for the weird and the very dangerous. I don't know what time of night it was, but I woke up to the sound of, I don't know, it almost sounded like human screaming, but more high-pitched. The sounds were coming from a few miles away, and I have to admit, it had me really spooked. I'm pretty familiar with the sounds of the American wilderness. And this was no screeching owl or bellowing elk, or wounded animal of any kind. The sounds changed between short high-pitched screams and then long, very deep howls. Sometimes they would come from one direction, and there would be a reply from a completely different direction. I've never been around wolves in the wild, so it might have been a wolf pack for all I know, only I'm pretty sure there are no known wild wolves in the Pacific Northwest. The howls and screams came pretty intermittently, maybe 
once or twice every 10 minutes or so, but lasted for a long while. I wasn't going to risk sleep with an unknown animal out there so close by. Maybe it was one or two weird or wounded elk. They can actually bellow pretty loud. I've just never heard that scream in this style before. Either way, wounded animals are dangerous. It was lucky that I stayed awake because at some point, again, hard to tell the time without a watch, after the howls and screams settled down, I heard heavy breathing, grunting, and shuffling in the woods nearby. I already had my knife wedged into my makeshift spear shaft, and honestly, I felt my blood go ice cold. Because I was pretty sure I knew exactly what was lumbering my way. These were sounds I recognized. A black bear lumbered through the trees, just a few dozen feet away. I held perfectly still, hoping it wouldn't decide to investigate my makeshift camp. But it probably spotted my lean-to and thought the same thing I was thinking when I built it. Dry shelter in the rain. The first thing I did was carefully observe the bear. It was definitely not full grown, and was a fair bit on the lean side of things. This meant two things, an inexperienced juvenile that had not done a very good job of fattening up for winter. On one hand, it could make the bear desperate for food and humans make good eating. On the other hand, it was likely weak, and if it had been so outcompeted for food, then it was likely a bit of a pushover. I also tapped into what I know about predatory animals. They prefer to ambush prey or launch hunts on their terms. Predators are notoriously shy animals and can have a very low confidence when confronted. This is because if a hunt goes awry, they can suffer an injury, and this could impact their ability to hunt and possibly lead to starvation. This is why you never run away from a predatory animal. It's usually better to simply back away confidently. Running triggers the hunt instinct, because you confirm to the predator that you're weaker than it and scared. I decided to take a huge gamble, and I ran out of my lean-to straight at the bear, shouting and yelling, thrusting with my spear. All things considered, I was basically trapped inside the lean-to and a bear could easily outrun you. It was a risk, but remember what I said about wilderness survival being risky? The bear immediately reared up on its paws, which is bad news bears, pun intended, because it might mean that it might try to fight back. Luckily for me, yelling and stabbing in the air in front of it like a wild man did the trick, and the bear lost its nerve and scampered back. I've been in close calls with wild animals, but I have never faced off a bear standing on its two hind legs. It's not something I care to ever repeat again unless I'm packing a 45 on my hip at minimum. The bear lumbered off, but I knew it wasn't safe to stay where I was. Any minute the bear could change its mind, so I packed up what few things I had and I immediately took off into the pitch black rainy woods. Normally, you never want to move at nighttime, as it's really easy to lose your bearings. If you have to, use the stars above you to pinpoint a single direction of travel and to stay in a straight line. That way, in daylight, you can retrace your steps and reorient yourself from more familiar ground. I walked for about 15 minutes and had to wait out the rainy night under a thick pine. Luckily, the rain abetted after a few hours, but I didn't get a lick of sleep that whole night. The next morning, I made my way back to my old camp, and sure enough, the bear had returned and trashed the place. I made the right call. Luckily, days two and three were far less eventful. I relocated my shelter to the other side of the creek, and it didn't rain for nights two and three. I changed my sleep schedule, though, to sleep during the day and stay up at night in case of wandering bear again. Also, I won't lie, those weird howls and screams had me on edge, especially after my encounter with the bear. On the coast, I managed to find edible mussels pretty easily and I ate some raw, which I immediately regretted, and then I roasted the rest in their own shells. Mussels are great for energy, but you have to be careful if you're low on water because they can add a lot of salt water to your system. If you aren't peeing regularly, the salt in your body can add up dangerously. By the way, they taste like mermaid boogers when you eat them raw. I also managed to find some edible flowering plants. With flowering plants, you want to pluck the actual flower off because the sap in the stem can be really bitter and unpleasant. The bud of the flower and the petals, though, make for good eating at a pinch. And dandelions typically grow in most places. If you really don't mind the bitterness, you can eat the roots of most flowering plants, which are chock full of minerals and nutrients. Though be careful, never eat a flowering plant whose flower is umbrella shaped. Those are poisonous and may not kill you, but will have your stomach twisted up in knots. Lichens and bugs made up most of the rest of my meals. Grubs were pretty plentiful in rotting logs. I couldn't remember which mushrooms are edible and which aren't, so I stayed away from them, better not risk it. Also, mushrooms don't actually pack a lot of energy, so don't waste time trying to look for them unless you have no other options. Same goes for trying to hunt. Wilderness survival is a numbers game, and your job is to waste as few calories as possible while gaining the most possible from what you eat. 
hunting can burn a lot of calories, so forget trying to catch anything larger than a squirrel or a rabbit. And even then, only go after them if you can make some rough traps and snares, or happen to find a burrow or warden. I made it through my three days pretty alright, but very much on the hungry side. My encounter with the bear, though, definitely left me a bit shaken. That was a very serious situation which could have gone very badly. The girlfriend wasn't happy to hear about it, and we both talked for a long time about those challenges. They have definitely started to ramp up in risk, and I guess I have to think about if I really want to keep on taking some of the risks I do. I love reading some of the feedback from you guys, and I'm happy that they're entertaining and sometimes even enlightening, but I guess this whole bear experience is just making me reconsider. I'm not saying that I'm never going to do a challenge again, but I feel I just have to give it some thought. At the very least, I need a race. Have you ever been stuck in a survival situation? What wilderness survival tips do you have to share? Tell us in the comments. Now go watch I Went Homeless for 72 Hours. As always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.